Christian McGee, and I serve this congregation as a commissioned lay minister. Thank you for joining us this morning as we gather once again, both in person and on Zoom, a spiritual community that seeks to be diverse and inclusive as we inspire love, work for justice, and grow together in community. We extend a special welcome to our visitors. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. For our visitors on Zoom, if you would like to know more about our church and be in contact with us, there will be a contact link in the chat box at the end of the service. Everyone on Zoom is also welcome to stay after the service and select a breakout room to talk with one another. I have many people to thank this morning for this service. I would like to express my gratitude to um, our music director, Katie, our administrator, Mary Beth, our director of religious education, Colleen, Ginny, who prepared the slides, our tech manager, Julie, producer, Max, and virtual host, Joe Kummerle. I would also like to thank the choir and Brad, who records our service. Special thanks to Ginny, Saunis, Lois, and Christy, who, have, who are going to speak today, and to Joe Brannon, who designed the awesome cover for the order of service. <laughs> Once again, I bid you welcome. Now, let us take a moment to breathe, to enter into this time of community once again, to invite the spirit of life to be present among us as we reflect on our shared ministries. Come, let us worship together. One of all of my my all-time favorite hymns is Wake Now My Senses. The lyrics are deep and meaningful, the music is lovely, and I just love singing it. It's a call to engage all of our self, mind, body, and spirit in the work of justice and compassion for humanity and the earth. It provides the framework for how to accomplish this goal. Hear the earth call. Join with each pilgrim who quests for the true. Take as your neighbor both stranger and friend. Join with all people whose rights are denied. Our ministry begins in church, but must be taken out in the world and shared. Service is an integral and oh so important part of making this. I am called to serve because of my commitment to making this beloved community the best place it can be. I want to share my gifts and talents with others. And I want to learn about myself, about the other members of this congregation, and about the community that we share. Service is a gift that gives in two directions. I feel that I've contributed to the greater good of this church, while at the same time, I feel a sense of pride that I've given something, that I've given some small part of myself to others. In the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, the purpose of life is not to be happy, it is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. We all have gifts to give. How are you called to serve? As Unitarian Universalists, we light a flame within a chalice to unite us in worship, to remind us of our ongoing search for the light of truth within us and among us, and to be a light that reveals to us the beauty in our world and each other. As Jeremiah and Justin come and light our chalice in the sanctuary, I invite you to light your home chalice Will you please join me in reading? 
The words for our chalice lighting by Richard S. Gilbert, which will be on the screen. Unfortunately, the insert for the order of service didn't get printed today, so we don't have song lyrics, but we can use the screen up above. O flaming chalice, symbol of a free faith, burn with the holy oil of helpfulness and service. Spread warmth and light and hope. Warm hearts grown cold with indifference. Light dark places with justice. Rekindle hope in despair. May we bring fuel for thy fire of love. May the oil of loving kindness flow from us to thy leaping flame. May hands of service shelter thee, that no winds of hate may extinguish thy brightness. May thy light and warmth be eternal. May we be keepers of thy flame. When I was asked to speak to you today about RE, I wondered to myself, will they stay with me for the whole three hours? <laughs> so settle in, friends. <laughs> no. RE does the important work of encouraging our young people to value themselves and their communities within which they live. We teach an understanding of world religions and beliefs we encourage reflection on the issues of justice that we face. We encourage reflection on truth and provoke questions about the meaning of life. RE offers opportunities for personal reflection, develops and affirms personal identity and responsible citizenship, promotes respect for self, others, self and others, and contributes to an understanding of history and culture. We develop personal well-being and happiness, and this helps our children and young people to make sense of who they are, to have the opportunity to have their views challenged in a safe place, and to make sense of this world around them. That's the kind of basic idea. But it is always our prayer in this church that all who enter know that they have a voice, that their ideas are valued, and that they are safe in this ever-evolving space. We seek to nurture our children with the goal that they feel and are empowered to be their authentic self now. Throughout the pandemic and now in this liminal time, our children and youth have continued to lead as they always have, by supporting each other, caring for each other, speaking up, and acting. I couldn't list all of the things that they have done if I tried, but I'm gonna try. <laughs> Just the last couple of years. They've written letters to the governors of all of the states of the union that allow conversion therapy demanding that it stop. They rebuilt a shed and repaired the home of an elderly woman in West Virginia. They've learned about themselves as human beings and the world around them by attending our whole lives sexuality education. They created, led, and started a successful community meal program right out of this building for those who are food insecure. They've discovered their magical selves and all of the power they have within them by going to Hogwarts. They've cooked, packaged, and delivered a three-course meal for the residents of our local homeless shelter. They've gathered together for fun, too, through dinners, haunted houses and haunted forests, sleepovers, cocoa and pajama parties, and game nights. They've encouraged you to give to children in need of school supplies. They've written letters of love and support to young people separated from their parents at the southern border. They've raised money for important missions like RAICES for, that specific, for the children and families at the border, Heifer International providing livestock for uh, small farmers, and to the Trevor Project. 
They've developed a relationship with the Portage County NAACP and were even honored this last fall as the recipients of the Youth Leadership and Social Justice Award. Those are our kids. Inside of this community, they've created worship services about protecting the environment, pride, service to others, and who will forget that middle school gem of opening up to joy, where they carried the simple message that laughter and joy are religious and spiritual. They've picked up trash, collected food and hygiene products for those in need, and some of our middle and high schoolers even volunteer in our nursery to help care for our littlest UUs. Their current mission is to invite this congregation into a conversation about signage at the old church. Stay tuned. As witness to their immense capacity to love humanity and themselves, RE teachers and volunteers are offered such a gift. Should you be a fly on the wall during RE or any of our programming or just hanging out in the church, you will hear and see acts of compassion and understanding that when I was a kid, I did not feel were possible. They celebrate each other's identity and they're there for each other as friends, as confidence and as confidants and as defenders. And they take up for each other. It's a beautiful thing. And they ask us to do the same. They ask us to help guide them on this faith journey and they show us what that could be if only we let them take the lead. In that lead position, we, the grown-ups, the volunteers, the teachers, and the guides are given a gift that I'm finding a little impossible to truly articulate. Do we have any RE teachers in this room? Volunteers. Do we have any on Zoom today? I believe we do. What gifts have you received? Shout it out and I'll, I'll respond. I'll repeat you. Inspiration. Inspiration. Hope. Hope. Connection. Connection. Resilience. 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 Patience. Patience. <laughs> and they with us. Questioning the status quo. Questioning the status quo. Mm -hmm. Laughter. Laughter. Anything else? Colored pencils. Colored pencils. <laughs> and markers. Creativity and art. I will add. An old shed. You helped restore an old woman's shed. Yes, you did, John. Yes, you did. Thank you. And you learned how to use a drill. Skills. Wonderful. This is our program. There are so many things that bring me joy in my life. But at the very top of that list are children. Yes, mine, but also the children of this community. They bring their compassion, love, and journey of faith to us and show us what kind of a world we can build together. I pinch myself on a regular basis about how incredibly blessed I am to call what I bear witness to a job. So I will leave you with this. It's by Gary Kowalski, titled, Children Widen the Circle of Our Being in Ways That Are Limitless. Children widen the circle of our being in ways that are limitless. Every baby born that's born connects us to our history, our own parents, grandparents, unknown forebearers who brought life to the new world in each successive generation, Every baby that's born links us to the future, to a world yet to come that belongs to our descendants and that we hold in trust for our prosperity, whom we will never know, or posterity, who we will never know. Each child connects us to nature, to innocence, and exuberance of a world always hatching newborns, kittens, and pups, and lambs, and babes. Each child reminds us of the kinship we share with people of other lands and races who love their young as purely and tenderly as we do. Each child connects us to the universe, to the holy mysteries 
of birth and death and becoming from which we all emerge. Children widen the circle of our being in ways that are limitless. And so I wonder, how will you widen your circle? And will you allow the children of this community to guide you? With that, let's get to work, kids. We're I spent my entire professional career in higher education where many colleges and universities are now, finally, seeing the value of cultivating a sense of belonging, and they see it as part of the learning and development of self. All of us want to feel that we work, study, and worship in places where we belong, even when we come from different backgrounds and experiences. And recent research suggests that we do well when we have an inner circle that includes people who are different from us, but that we share certain connections, certain values among us. For me, this congregation is such a place, and I'm happy today to reflect, reflect briefly on this area of our shared ministry. When I first came to this congregation, I didn't know anyone. I was glad to be greeted at the door, given an order of service, and invited to stay after the service at a meet and greet. Soon after that, I was asked to be a greeter and to welcome others. I felt uh, how strange it would be for a newcomer to be welcoming people who'd been members of this congregation for decades, but I was assured that a friendly face at the door would make a difference to everyone. Before COVID, I joined the membership welcome team and really enjoyed the conversations good food and shared work with Claudia, Diane, Marion, and Mary in planning for ways to welcoming, welcome new and continuing members. As we engaged in the Journey of Belonging series for adults to learn more about our faith and congregation, it has been an honor to be with those exploring our principles and traditions with newcomers and seeing some of them sign the Book of Membership. The conversations have been intimate and important, and I was honored to be part of those connections, as well as the covenant group I've been in with my spouse, Brooke, for several years. Once COVID made in-person meetings impossible, I was glad to be part of the tech team as we tried to connect people in new ways. It's an honor now to serve with Julie, Brad, Jen, Max, Dave, Kara, Lois, and others in connecting those physically present for a service with those who are joining virtually, and as we think about ways to keep people engaged regardless of the ways they connect. For me, being part of these efforts in our congregation has been a joy, as I contribute by connecting others, but I also gain a deeper sense of my own belonging and purpose, my own way of being part of our mission to inspire love, to seek justice, and to grow in community. One of the best gifts we can give ourselves in our busy lives and in these challenging times is to care for our inner spiritual life. Each week we create a time of shared stillness for prayer, reflection, gratitude, meditation, or simply being here in order to remember who we truly are, reflect on life, and reconnect with the sacred mystery that is the very heart of life itself. Let's enter the stillness for a minute or two together. Life is a mystery that brings many things. Part of our experience is struggle and loss. In the spirit of being a community of compassion and care, we take time to share those sorrows, struggles, and losses that are in our hearts right now. If you are on Zoom and have a sorrow, loss, or struggle to share, please use the chat box. We 
Lois asks for our love and concern for friends of the church, Greg and Cheryl. Greg's father passed away last Saturday. We send them our heartfelt condolences. Carol asks for prayers for victims of gun violence. Indeed, gun violence, police brutality, and brutality of any sort. We hold those who are victims in our hearts and continue our work of justice in the world. Colin shares their mental health has been a big struggle. We send our thoughts and love to you, Colin. I would also ask for prayers of good healing for my wife's aunt, Lori Goldstone Merkin, who was recently diagnosed with uh, brain cancer. Will you please join me now in the spirit of prayer meditation, as is your practice. Spirit of life and death, thou who art as present to us in our suffering as in our well-being, abide with us in this permeable time between dusk and dark. Soothe the secret pains we carry. Bless us with the courage to move forward, move toward our grief and not away. When all is hidden, when we find ourselves moving among the shadows, when we do not know the way, quiet our hearts and still our restlessness. Help us to embrace the unknown, to hold the mystery, and to let ourselves be held by it. For thou art the greatest hiddenness, and yet we know that our breath is not so close to us as thy presence. Abide with us, O spirit of compassion, as the power of healing, the assurance of peace, the love that will not let us go. Amen. Life also brings joy, wonder, and awe. We've experienced moments this week that lift our spirits. Once again, please use the chat box in order to share your joys with us. Nancy shares that she is looking forward to her new life in a new place all by herself for the very first time. She is very excited about that. That's my mom, by the way. <laughs> and I'm excited for her. What joy, wonder, and awe are you feeling this morning? Seeing old friends back in church. Seeing old friends back in church, yes. Experiencing silly games night. Experiencing silly games night. That sounds fun. With gratitude for these, oh, Colin is excited to try Kent Skates in downtown Kent. Yes, that does sound fun. With gratitude for these and every blessing we receive in life, for the gift of life itself, for the companionship of one another on life's journey, for the beauty of this world and this day of possibility, we raise our hearts in gladness with the word, Amen. Spirit of shared ministry, we need your help on this piece. So every so often, I'm not going to be able to do this with holding the mic. Um, let me use this mic. Can I get this back to you? So there's a clapping rhythm, and it goes like this. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Good. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. A little faster. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. 
So you're going to do that every time you hear the choir singing and some just clap their hands. Is that an easy enough cue? Yeah. <laughs> and some just clap their hands or paws or anything they got. Good. Some just clap their hands or paws or anything they got. See, they can do it. They didn't think you could do it, but I knew you could do it. <laughs> They're the okay, okay. crowd. <laughs> okay, so we do this four times at the beginning of the piece, and then every time you, just once every time you hear, and some just clap their hands. Cool, thanks. Hi, I'm Sonis Parsons, uh, and I'm supposed to be providing some inspiration today around the music program. So, <laughs> I grew up with music in my life, in my home, in the car, in school, through pretty much all of my life. I sang in groups outside of uh, school. I sang in church all the time. It was a huge part of my life. I found as I got older and other things encroached, I kind of did a little less of that. But I did have a group of friends that sang together once a week, and from some of them, I learned about this crazy church that had this really amazing music that was not your average church music. And um, they suggested that I try it, and I came with a friend, and we stuck around. 
one of the very first things I did was join the music program here. And I made friends through that program. I got to know people immediately. Um, there's a lot of laughter in, in uh, singing. And it's a, it was a wonderful experience. I made friends there that continue to be friends to this day. And I, I reclaimed a joy of doing music in community. Um, and I'd like to impart some of that today. I um, know that at one point, this church had more musicians and music volunteers than any other kind of volunteer. I was shocked at one point to hear how many people were doing that program. Um, but I will say that we've taken some hits over the past few years between COVID and losing some folks that had been, you know, people who were stalwarts in our church and our music program. Uh, we've, we've taken some hits. We had, a, we had a bell choir for a long time. We had children's music. We've, we had an, our choir was an all ages choir for a long time, folk orchestra, lots of solo musicians. And we've had some hits that have sort of taken our music program down a notch. But we have a new music director who is really trying hard to bring us back together and get us to come back in and make music together. And I think this is really important. A lot of churches, as they start to flounder, they start to shrink, they have trouble with their finances. One of the first things that goes is live music. A lot of them try and save money that way. They, they just figure it'll, it'll be better for their bottom line. A lot of them find that it actually serves them poorly in the long run. Live music is the soundtrack to our services. It, it makes us feel inspired. It makes us feel reverent. It makes us feel fired up to go out there and do good stuff. Music in community is good for us. It's good for our own personal health. It's good for our own personal connections. They found in lots of studies that people who sing and make music together have better mental health, emotional health, even physical health. And it sure is better for our church's health. You make community connections. It is one of the best ways to get to know people. So I think that it's really important for us to keep having a music ministry that is live, not piped in all the time. And I think that a, an, a good music ministry helps a church to thrive. We need people to come back out for the music program. We need um, people who are confident musicians and we need people who are closet musicians. We need people that are trained, and we need people who aren't. We need people that are bold, and we need people that are, prefer to stand in the back row as far from the microphone as possible. And we have plenty of those folks in the choir as it stands now. I would love it if we had a bell choir again, if we had a folk orchestra again, if we had children in our music program regularly again. That would be so awesome to me. So musicians, we need you, we want you. We, we aren't necessarily looking for the right people or the perfect people. We just would like to see your faces in music. You can do solo music, you can um, be background singers, you can <laughs> just support the music program, but we'd love to have you. You can clap your hands. You can clap your hands. <laughs> Well, good morning. That's hard to follow. Uh, I've been asked to talk about the volunteers that provide the support for this church. You know, we have a lot of visible ministries. Our, you know, our minister, our worship team, our music program. That's the, the face of the church, the people that greet you when you come in. Um, uh, but you know, there's a lot of volunteer jobs in this church that are, are less visible, but just as important. Um, membership team comes to mind. And, and I, 
there's a lot more and I'm not going to be able to remember them all. I'm here mainly to speak about the finance related uh, ministries of this church. Um, our staff and our campus are foundational to everything that we do here and the finances of the church are, are what keep those things going and we need a whole team of people to do the work of finances uh, in, this, in this congregation. Um, I'm currently serving my fifth term as treasurer <laughs> of our church. Um, and I came, I came to, the, to be the treasurer by way of being a financial secretary. And many of you probably don't even know that we have financial secretaries or what they do, but they're people that come, people like Sonis and Ann, that come once a week, work with a helper, count the money that is collected on Sundays and comes in. And they count the money and they document everything and they make the deposits. Um, you know, those things are kind of invisible, but, but super important. Um, and so, you know, how did I become treasurer? Well, it kind of, word got around that I like spreadsheets. <laughs> There's beauty and genius in a well-made spreadsheet. <laughs> it's spiritual. It's, it's spiritual. <laughs> but no, um, and I've really, it's, it's, it's a big job and it's been hard, but I've also really enjoyed it. And part of the reason that I've, it's been really good for me is, is it's more opportunity for connection. Um, as part of the job of treasurer, I serve on the ministry executive team. So I get to work on a regular basis with Reverend Stephen and our administrator, Mary Beth Hannon, who as our bookkeeper, by the way, does a phenomenal amount of work, really good work. We should not forget her. <laughs> um, I've got to work with them and you know other people that have come to the MET from the board, you know, by way of being moderator. Um, I'm also a liaison to the board on matters of finances, and so I've gotten to be able to know people on the board over the years. And um, we also work with um, you know like the buildings and grounds team who are super important to keeping everything beautiful and running and warm and comfortable around here. Um, the auction team, the generosity team, all of these people do lots of behind the scenes work that most of us never see and it's, it's really important. Um, and I had to make notes here because there's so many and I wanna be sure and lift them all up. FinSex, the Finance Committee. We don't have one right now, we need one. <laughs> the Finance Committee is, is responsible for kind of overseeing the general financial you know, uh, uh, state of the church. Um, they help put together the budget. Um, we need to revitalize our Finance Committee. Um, we have an Endowment Committee whose job it is to uh, receive the gifts from the church that are meant to be held for future um, for the future, and they oversee that and see that it's it's invested properly. And of course, I mentioned Mary Beth, our bookkeeper and admin and generosity team, fundraising team, um, all these people, don't forget them. They're really important and they keep all the stuff that you see every day going. So thank you, everybody. Hi, I'm Reverend Christy Anderson. I attended college in the early 1970s. I was the epitome of everything President Richard Nixon despised. <laughs> I grew my hair down below my waist, wore granny dresses with hiking boots, which adorned my unshaven legs. <laughs> I attended every college protest I could, mostly anti-war and anti-Vietnam draft protests, along with protests against college policies such as dress codes. I was anti-authoritarian, idealistic, naive, self-righteous. 
motivated by anger against the establishment. Decades later, I read several books by physician, counselor, and author Rachel Naomi Remen. She made a statement that has stayed with me ever since. I don't serve because the world is broken. I serve because life is sacred. This made me realize that I don't want to be motivated by the toxic emotion of anger. I want to act out of love to enhance this sacred life for all. Applying this concept to racial justice work, I realized I have a choice. I can be motivated by my hate toward bigoted people, which would feed my feeling of anger, causing me to carry that poisonous emotion. I know anger can be a powerful motivating factor, but I don't want to die angry and brokenhearted. Instead, I can act from a feeling of love for my black and brown brothers and sisters and fight for them to be graced by the blessings I have. A mindset which feeds my sense of gratitude. With this attitude, racial justice work, including the significant work here by the Race for Justice team and all of you as allies. This work has become more of a spiritual practice for me. It's expanded my world, often by amplifying the voices of African Americans, especially through relationships and reading. I've been heartbroken when hearing stories about living while black in America. I've been shocked by reading about omissions from our American history lessons. I realized that during my earlier years, I unknowingly had been indoctrinated into accepting a misleading and even false American story. Racial justice work continuously reveals new insights which make me feel liberated and exhilarated. At times, it is such a powerful feeling that I want to shout my newly discovered truths to all the other white people. <laughs> this sense of liberation helped me to overcome any feelings of guilt or shame because I'm white. Instead, I feel empowered because I am white. As a white person, I have advantages and power that I can cash in to rectify the past. Exposing myself to the harsh and ugly side of life is truly painful. But as I experience the whole realm of human emotions, I grow. When I am intensely engaged with this sacred work, I feel fully alive. And by working with others, it provides me with a shared sense of purpose and support when I'm weary. By viewing this justice work from a more positive perspective, it deepens my compassion, helps me to learn more about myself, and it's made me a better person. I am thriving as a novice member of a boot camp for justice warriors, moving forward motivated by love and like Cupid, armed with arrows of love as my weapon. I hope you'll join us. I would just like to express again my gratitude for everyone who shared this morning. I really am inspired by your words. When I came to this congregation in 2005, I was shocked, shocked that members of the congregation were offering services. What? <laughs> Coming from a Catholic background, I didn't know that was possible. When the priest is gone, they bring another priest in. It, you know, that's just how it works. So I was very intrigued, and I thought, well, I can do that. 
So I offered my first service in one of those early summers. And I remember it was about the importance of animals in our lives, our pets, of love for our pets. And Elaine Bowen was my worship associate. It was much harder than I anticipated. It was too short and not very substantive, but I tried and it gave me a taste of preaching. And the rest, as they say, is history. Shortly thereafter, I became a a worship associate myself under the guidance and tutelage of our previous minister, Melissa Carvel-Zemer. I modeled my preaching style after hers in those early days. Being an academic, I struggled to be more spiritual and less luxury. I learned many things from many different ministers, not the least of whom is our own minister, Reverend Stephen. Over time, I refined my preaching style to be what it is today, and I'm sure it will continue to evolve. I'm also sure that no one would argue, although we are you used, so you never know, (laughs) that worship is one of the most important areas of ministry for any church. It's what we come for. It's what gets people in the door. I love being part of the worship arts team with Reverend Stephen. Our meetings are spent in thoughtful conversation about what's happening in the world and how we might best address those topics for the congregation. Worship on Sunday morning is of course a spiritual practice that feeds our soul, but it it is also the work but so is the work of putting a service together, finding just the right reading or song, writing a sermon, and seeing it all come together on Sunday morning is very fulfilling. For me, it is truly a labor of love. This beloved church community would not be here without all of our love and care in the form of time, talent, and treasure. We all have talents to share. Whether we have lots of free time or only a little, there is always a way to get involved. And in fact, today after service, we are having an opportunities mingle. On the tables in the back will be set up um, various church committees and information about the life and work of this church. So if you see people scurrying around in the back after service, just feel free to stand up and mingle so that they can um, get their tables set up. I do hope you stay, um, even just to learn about one other committee that you didn't know what they really do. Once we embrace service as a spiritual practice, we can see it not as a job to be done, but rather as a labor of love that benefits us all. May it be so. Our spiritual community thrives in its shared life of worship, community, and ministry as each of us participates in the circle of giving and receiving. This is possible due to your generous gifts of money, time, and care for each other and the recognition that we are all connected. To help others in our community thrive, we also give to agencies and organizations in Kent and beyond that serve those in need. January's special offering benefits the Kent chapter of PFLAG. PFLAG is the nation's first and largest organization dedicated to supporting, educating, and advocating for LGBTQ plus people and those who love them. In the spirit of gratitude for the gift of one another and this community, and the abundance that makes generosity possible, we now give and receive the offering as a sign of our shared commitment to the life and work of this congregation and beyond. Will you please join me now in the words for extinguishing our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. May we carry these in our hearts and minds until we are together again. These words are by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Everybody can be great.
because everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics in physics to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. And now let us go forth in joy and hope as we continue to inspire love, seek justice, and grow in community. May it be so, blessed be, amen, and I see the light in you. Thank you.